Good evening. I'd like to welcome you to this presentation in the School of Arts and Sciences Distinguished Lecturer Series. I'm Linda Ball Thaser, Assistant Dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, and I'm pleased to be here this evening on behalf of Dean Kufadakis, who is unable to be with us because of a religious observation. As you notice in our printed program, our series goes back to 1982. And over that period of time, we've had a wide range of presentations on a variety of topics. And we're pleased, especially this evening, for the topic that's going to be presented to us. But in the tradition of this series, I would like to begin with a presentation. Dr. Giannis? We'd like to present this slide to you as our distinguished lecturer. Your name has also been engraved on the composite plaque that hangs in the Dean of Arts and Sciences Conference Room. It's a pleasure to have you with us. Thank you very much. Thank you. Do I take it away here? Okay. Thank you. Let me get my book turned on. I'm put this work off a little bit. Professor Farlow will make the formal introduction. Well, it gives me great pleasure to introduce tonight's speaker, Dr. Christine Janis. I've known Chris for longer than I care to remember, and no doubt longer than she cares to remember. But she is a native of London, England. She did her undergraduate work at the University of Cambridge, and then received her PhD from Harvard University. She is now at the faculty of Brown University in Providence, Rhode Island, in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology. Her research interests are varied, mainly concerned with the evolution of mammals, the interaction of body form and ecology and evolution. And, um, she is said to be a very animated speaker uh, who does not resemble all cartoon characters who might be considered. <laughs> and I'm sure it'll be a very interesting presentation tonight. Yours, Chris. Thank you very much for inviting me out here, Jim, and other people. It's uh, really a privilege and a delight to be here. And um, I'm very glad I'm going to be able to share with you some of the things that really excite me about thinking about animals and animal evolution and evolutionary biology. Um, I've always really liked animals, and when, I, when my mother took me to see Fantasia, the movie, at the, uh, when I was seven, um, it was an incredible revelation to me was a whole dinosaur scene. There was this whole other group of extinct animals out there that vastly outnumbered the living ones. It was really a big thrill. Um, when I was a child, I really wanted to know all about these animals and what they did and how they lived and, and how they evolved. And coming to, uh, to work on that as an adult, what's been of more interest to me now is, is, is more thinking about how, how what happened happened. We can see certain patterns in the fossil record and evolution, but how and why did it happen that way? And we have a number of stories that we tell for how things happened. But sometimes there's stories that stand up to scientific scrutiny. And sometimes there's stories that have more of a basis in our, in our whoops, I went dead. No problem here? Sometimes they I yell. <laughs> Sometimes there's, can you hear me? Sometimes there's stories that have more of a basis in our, our cultural bias and our ideas about uh, the way things are meant to be, more than they are in, um, more than they are in, in any real sort of scientific sense. Anyway, let's get on with the first slide. Slide is sort of a, you can't see a thing at all. This is sort of a tribute to Jim here, uh, dinosaur slide. Um, 
The reason why I'm sharing this slide is because one of the very uh, standard and enduring stories we have about the evolution of animals and what happened is this notion of there being some sort of battle between carnivores and herbivores, between prey and predators. And this idea, well, also extends to living animals, but particularly the idea that over time there's been this ongoing competition and battling for supremacy between the carnivores and the herbivores. We normally see this story with respect to dinosaurs, but we also see it with respect to mammals. This is a very nice picture from a book I originally got as a child by uh, Burian, which sort of shows uh, a Pleistocene scene of a, of a, a million or so years ago of some wolves chasing a, an Irish elk here. And um, here, here, here what we're seeing is the carnivores being uh, members, of, uh, members of the mammal order, order carnivora and the herbivores being animals we, we would call ungulates. Ungulates being hoofed mammals, including things like deer, horses, cattle, giraffe, those kinds of animals. Um, but part of the problem I have with these evolutionary stories is that in, in sort of telling this idea of this predator and prey through time, ungulates are seen very much just as being fodder. They're not seen as having a life of their own, an evolutionary history of their own. They're seen as being there for the glory of the carnivores. Um, and this is also true in our, in our, in our view of modern animals. There's a, a program on cable TV that runs weekly. It's called Fangs about carnivores. You know, why is there no program called Molas? <laughs> and why are you all laughing? I'd watch it, you know? No, 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 we think, we think that carnivores are really cool. And we have this inbuilt bias to think of carnivores as being where the action is. This and something else I'll show you later on are from the uh, National Lampoon's parody, uh, Popular Evolution. Uh, and even our own language reflects this attitude we have towards carnivores. Contrast, if you will, the difference between our use of the words leonine and asinine, or foxy and sheepish. Part of my objections to seeing the carnivores as being the top guys and seeing the herbivores as being these sort of stupid, dumb animals who aren't really doing anything but being eaten is because, well, some of, some of my best friends are ungulates. And I've always felt uh, that their story isn't really being told properly. So what I'm going to do tonight is to try and present a story in mammal evolution about uh, a classical idea about how carnivores and herbivores have interacted through time and then see whether it stands up to scrutiny or whether it's just an idea we have because of our inbuilt bias towards uh, thinking that carnivores are somehow ruling everything. This picture shows in cartoon fashion this idea we have of there having been what's called an arms race in the evolution of, of carnivores and ungulates. So we're going through time here on the left we have um, an ear team of and we're going back to 50 million years ago, so a little horse and a carnivore. Then we have a more recent, a mild scene, like a 20 million year old horse and a carnivore, and finally a recent horse and a carnivore. And the idea being is somehow, through evolutionary history, they've been ch chasing and being chased, and in concert, gotten longer legs and faster running speeds. The term arms race comes, of course, from the idea of the uh, build up of arms say, in the Cold War between the, uh, between the US and the Soviet Union. You know, one side gets some more bombs, so the other guy gets some more bombs. So, that's, so the first side gets some more bombs, and the second side gets some more bombs, and finally, you know, both economies collapse out of the strain. Seems to have happened. But um, basically, the, the idea is, is, is there's been this sort of co-evolutionary acceleration, or escalation, of the ability to run, to chase and be chased. The idea is that the uh, herbivore starts to run a little faster to avoid being eaten. If the carnivore doesn't then start to run faster too, it'll starve, so it starts to run faster, and so on. These guys chasing each other down the eons in some sort of way, so you evolve animals who are going faster and faster and faster. Okay, so does this very popular notion actually reflect what really happened? 
or does it reflect some kind of inbuilt bias we have towards, um, towards how we perceive how things might have happened? I think we do have an inbuilt bias towards thinking of carnivores as being the animals who are somehow ruling the ecosystem, you know, king of the jungle. This is my little cartoon here of a, a Victorian naturalist here. A lot of our, of our studies of, of the ecology of animals come from the days of uh, hunting out in the colonies in, in, in East Africa. The whole sort of 19th century idea of Tennyson's nature, red and tooth and claw as a competition and it's a tough world out there and things are killing each other and, uh, and this idea that somehow carnivores hunting down their prey is akin to us hunting for sport and so on and so forth. So, um, and whereas in fact, carnivores, rather than being the dominant animals, are in fact quite, are in fact quite fragile members of the ecosystem. Part of the reason why most present-day large carnivores are endangered species is because they're the, they're, they're, they're the top of the food pyramid, and, and if there's a problem with the ecosystem, they're the first to go. Okay. So, as I said, what I want to do is examine this idea of these guys chasing the other through time. I'll back up to this slide. And ask the question, okay, I think it's fairly clear that animals who run fast have long legs. I mean, after all, we race greyhounds, not dachshunds. Um, and long legs seem to be important for fast running. But that's very different from asking the question is, where long legs evolved for fast running? Or is it just that if you happen to have long legs for some other reason, can you then run fast? So I'm gonna ask the question, were long legs evolved to run fast to start with? And secondly, did the evolution of long legs happen in this kind of co-evolutionary arms race with a small change in the herbivores being matched by a small change in the carnivores and so on and so forth over time? Okay, so having sort of set the scene there, first what I want to do is to back up a little bit and just say, what is the evidence from the fossil record that you have this increase in leg length over time? There's been this change in animals getting longer legs over time, which we are presuming reflects increased speed. Okay, here we have this very familiar picture of the story of horse evolution. Here the horses are drawn on the same side. Here we have the scale. And this is a sort of familiar textbook story of the earliest horse being a little guy with fairly short legs and lots of toes, evolved over time to a bigger guy with only one toe and longer legs. I think we're so familiar with that as being a textbook story of evolution that we think it just applies to the horse. We forget that in fact, all animals who are large and specialized, all mammals who are large and specialized today started off their evolutionary history as, as small and less specialized. Basically, for the first, for over the first 100 million years of mammal evolutionary history, they were basically vermin in the shadow of, of the dinosaurs. Thank you, Jim. Yeah, but this one's making a face at your guys. And uh, it was not until the, the dinosaurs became extinct at the end of the Mesozoic that it was the start of the Cenozoic era, uh, starting 65 million years ago, that mammals then were sort of freed from this uh, presence of, of dinosaurs and uh, could evolve into being larger, more specialized animals, taking the place of the dinosaurs, if you will. So this starting out as being small and fairly short legged -like, unspecialized, and then over evolutionary time, becoming larger, more specialized, longer legged, applies to a, a lot of animals. It applies to all the ungulates, uh, not, not, not just the horses, but to deer, to cow, to giraffe, to elephants, to rhinos. Also applies to the carnivores. These guys are more of the same size, but the guy on top would be about the size of, of a of a ferret, and this, and then this is meant to be a modern greyhound kind of dog. And you can see how the legs have gotten longer. I'll point out some, if I had a real point of it, I'll try and point out some of the features of how the leg legs have changed as we go along. Okay, so this picture shows us how a picture of how the hand 
has changed in terms of increasing the length of the whole limb. Ignore these guys. If you look here, this is, this is what the ankles do and the wheel will look like. And they have our hands not too unlike ours. We have fairly short hand bones with short fingers and the same five fingers. And then if you sort of follow going up here, B, C, D, E, F. What's happened is a lot of the lengthening of the leg has come from lengthening the bones of the hand or in the back leg from lengthening the bones of the foot. And in conjunction with this, well, the horse only has one main toe remaining. Uh, other ungulates, like the cloven hooved ungulates, have two toes remaining. That's what, that's what the cloven is, it's two toes. And they've lost the, uh, lost the toe to the side. And uh, there's a popular idea that doing this um, helps to increase your ability to run fast. You have a longer leg, a lighter leg, a leg that is more streamlined. As shown here in our popular evolution, we have this thing, reducing your side toes. How much will it really add to your running speed? <laughs> okay, so that's sort of, sort of a little bit of, of what's actually happened. But um, I think when we're thinking about the evolution of the horse, again, something that's often missing from the more popular descriptions is it's often assumed that what's happening is the horse is evolving from something you know, small and inefficient into something that's you know, modern and modernized and more efficient, more adapted. Most things in evolution are not any kind of drive to perfection. To think of the evolution of the horse, you've got to put it in the context of what the climatic changes have been over the past 60 million years. And basically what you've had is a world that's gone from being almost all tropical forest right up to within the confines of the Arctic Circle to a world which is, has, has cold at the higher latitudes of ice at the poles, more temperate regions at the higher latitudes, and tropical type forests only at the equator. So in the Eocene, when you had the first horses, that North America or, or Europe would have looked rather like this, with lush tropical forests. This, this, this would have been about 55 million years ago and animals that were more typical of the kind of form of uh, animals found today in tropical forests. Um, and then the higher latitudes about 20 million years ago in the, in the start of the Miocene started to become cooler and drier and you saw the spread of grasslands. And it was at this point when you started to see horses of still up here becoming um, larger, longer legged, and you had more evidence of, of animals looking more like modern ones in terms of being bigger, having longer legs, looking more like running kinds of, of mammals. What we're going to be doing in this lecture is looking at evidence from the fossil record of North America. And of course North America has a very good record. North America was also an island the continent uh, for much of the Cenozoic, which means that if the climate changed, there was no connection to South America animals could not follow their preferred habitat back down to, south, back down to the equator. They had to stay in place uh, or go extinct. And so there's a lot of, some of the evolutionary changes we see in North American animals are easier to understand. And in fact, horses evolved in North America, even though they're not native to North America today. So in fact, this is a little cartoon showing you on the top here the traditional idea of how the horse evolution happened, the idea of a little primitive horse moving somehow of its own volition out of the forests into the plains, whereas going down the side is more the idea of uh, probably what really happened, the horse didn't do any changing at all of its own volition, it stayed put in North America and the climate changed around it, so it had to, uh, it had to um, change or basically adapt or die. Some of you might recognize I have the Red Queen here who's scrolling the landscape back and that of course relates to the, uh, red, sort of the Red Queen idea in ecology and evolutionary biology, the idea that like the Red Queen in uh, Alice Through the Looking Glass, you have to run as fast as you can just to stay in the same place. Most evolution is just about staying in the same place while things around you change. For those of you really in the know, this up here is meant to be Lee Van Balen. Okay. A few of you will, know, will understand that joke. Okay, so there's the, con <laughs> there's the context of what we're looking at. So if we're going to try and examine this 
in terms of making some testable hypotheses with the fossil record, we're going to have to come up with a way of estimating how leggy animals were. We've already said that we think that it's pretty obvious today that if, if you want to run, you have to have, run fast, you do have to have long legs. The diversity of living animals more or less shows that to us. So how are we going to have some index we're going to look at to determine leg length in fossils? And if we actually look at how animals who are specialized for running in cursors, uh, a cursor of the runner, the same, the same word you use with a cursor on your computer screen. I think what you can see from this is that not only are they standing up on tippy toe rather than their foot flat on the ground, but their legs are long in a certain way. They have not elongated all of the leg bones equally. And this is the hind leg. The thigh bone is fairly, the femur is fairly constant leg. It's what's really become elongated are the bones of the foot, same as the bones of a hand I showed you here in the earlier slide. And those are the, the metatarsals in the hind limb here. So one common indicator that's been used of the index of how leggy an animal is, is what we call the uh, metatarsal to femur ratio. Here's the femur in, what we have here, we have carnivores on the left, herbivores on the right. On the top we have unspecialized guys who have short metatarsals in comparison to their femur. They're not particularly good runners. On the bottom we have more specialized guys who have elongated the legs of their metatarsals. In terms of how long the metatarsal is compared to how long the femur is, can be used as an index of, leg of legginess, an index of cursoriality, that is, is more or less free of total body size. There is a few problems, and some of these details I, I can discuss with you guys later on if you like. But in general, um, carnivores and herbivores do have different proportions. So you do have to examine them separately. You can't mix them up together. But in examining carnivores versus herbivores, uh, it's fairly constant you know, in the two separate groups that that ratio is going to give you some index of how long limb the animal is. And these are bones that tend to preserve in the fossil record, unlike more delicate things like rib bones, for example. So we actually can get that information. So I'm going to be asking two questions, okay? One is, if we actually look at the fossil record, is there evidence for like a stepwise coevolution between the leg lengths over time? Here we have time going this way. We're going to have leg lengths here. I said ungulates and carnivores were four them separately, so ungulates are going to be somewhat more leggy than carnivores. Again, the reasons why that is is something I can talk with you about later on, or, to, or the reasons perhaps why that is, no one really knows for sure. If there was this kind of coupled coevolutionary event, we would expect to see a stepwise correlation as one guy got leggier, and so the other guy got leggier, and so on through time. You're both starting with short legs and both ending with long, and both ending with long legs, but doing it in a coupled, concerted fashion. Another thing to look at is to look at living animals and to say, is there a correlation between the leg length and running speed? Now, obviously, obviously in general, longer limbed animals run faster than the, the short limbed ones. I put dogs in bad because I couldn't figure out how to spell Daxon. <laughs> but um, in general, it's true. But if you look within a group of already long limbed animals, is there a super correlation between the relative limb, limb, between the relative limb length and the speed? If you've got two horses or two greyhounds, would the one with the longer legs always win the race? And if that's not true, if there's no simple correlation like that, then we have to ask the question, well, is being long legged just about fast running? Okay, so I'm going to spend most of my time looking at the first question, and then spend a, a shorter amount of time looking at the, the living animals. Okay. I um, just, just want to make the point. Well, what we're going to be doing here is considering the evolution or even the very existence of what we would call pursuit predators. 
that is, predators who chase their prey, who run their prey down. And a pursuit predator is defined as an animal who will chase the prey for more than 300 meters. Pursuit predators are normally pack hunters, like uh, wolves or some hyenas, but not always. The cheetah qualifies as a pursuit predator, but does not normally hunt in packs. Secondly, um, you can have pack hunters that are not pursuit predators. The lion hunts in packs, but it's actually an ambush predator. Now, in fact, although our popular idea of predators is of them chasing down some hapless beasts and, and running into the ground, in fact, the majority of living carnivores are, are ambush predators, animals who will lie in wait and hunt in a single fashion, perhaps in pairs, and then will have a short death out after their prey and normally grapple it with the forelimbs and have powerful forelimbs. So that's, in fact, a more common mode, even today, of hunting than is being a pursuit predator. The issue of long legs and running speed, obviously, is going to apply to, um, to the pursuit predator, not the ambush predator. Basically, you would only need to have long legs as an ungulate if what you were doing was running away from a pursuit predator. You can't really, you know, if, if you're being jumped at from behind a bush, whether you have long legs or not isn't going to make any difference. You know, you're either caught in the first few seconds or you aren't. Okay, so that's the issue that, that, that we're going to look at. Okay. So let's see what actually happens when we look at this. Up on top is what I told you what, what, what would be the prediction, the, what, what you would predict to happen, the expected pattern if you had this kind of coevolution. On the bottom is, what, is, is an idealized version. I'm going to show you the real data in a minute, and they're much more messy. An idealized version of what you actually see. What you actually see is that about 20 million years ago, in the early Mars there's a step up in the proportions of limbs, the ungulates, so they become more legged at this point. But the carnivores don't do their catching up until about five million years ago in the Pliocene. So you've got about a 15 million year gap here where you have leggy ungulates and you don't have leggy carnivores. And something is, is coincident with this, this is in North America, these days are from North America, is at this time is around about the first spread of grasslands to give you a, a show and getting like savannah environment which lasted until about five million years ago, and it then got replaced by the more balanced prairie than we have today. And in the Plata, that's where you, you have just about a tenth of prairie, and you get the migration around you, know, things like caribou or in Africa, you get the zebra, wildebeest, those kinds of things. So that's, keep an eye on what the idealized thing is, and I'm going to show you the real data. Uh, apologize, this, this my cat seems to have been sleeping on the slide, judging by the amount of hair on it. Um, what was it showing us? Okay, very generally. In general, carnivores are pink and yellow and, and red. Herbivores are blue and green. Okay, this red line shows you the carnivores are four below that line, the ungulates above the line. What these guys with lines across here are doing is showing you where present day animals fall. So this is this is the timeline going from the Eocene through to the recent span of about 55 million years or so. This on the y-axis here is the index of legginess. So animals with a higher number are more leggy. What I want to look at, ignore the black filled in um, symbol. What they show you is small guys, guys under about 20 pounds. So those guys, even if they are leggy, are not going to be, you know, running around in packs or bringing down herds of, of animals. In fact, smaller animals, funnily enough, actually tend to be more leggy than bigger ones. They just don't seem that way because their legs are more bunched up. A fox actually has proportionally longer legs than a dog. But you think that because they tend to walk with, with their legs more, uh, more bent up. So ignoring the black symbols and just looking at the coloured ones, what you can see is that the, the point where the ungulates sort of do that step up in proportions to being about the 
same as modern day guys, is round about the start of the Nazi, about 25 to 20 million years ago. But the carnivores still stay at the limb portions of animal species, so they kind of uh, live similar kind of legginess to pumas and lions. They don't, you don't see a large carnivore with limb proportions like that of modern day pursuit predators until the Pleiades, until about five million years ago. That was the guy that, that was a pink cross there, and you'll show you a picture of that guy in a minute. You have got some animals back here that look more leggy, like back in the Eocene, but in fact, these red crosses here, those animals um, are not, they're classified as carnivores, but they have teeth that show they were bone crushers. There are these things called mesonychids that gave rise to whales. They were not, in fact, real, um, the same kind of carnivores as the animals we think today of, of, of being predatory carnivores. So the data show that although you have plenty of carnivores around, they all have the proportions of being ambush predators until about five million years ago. What I want to do is show you some pictures of some of these guys. What we're going to be doing is comparing on the top here African ungulates with some of these guys who are around in, in the North American Miocene. Basically, by the middle Miocene, by about 15 million years ago, the ungulates in North America were fully as leggy as any of the guys today in modern Africa. And I compare them with Africa because it, because it was a sort of Serengeti savanna like habitat here back then. What's interesting, of course, is rather than having antelope, uh, the animals are made up of a diversity of uh, horses and camels. But although there was a different taxonomic diversity, it was a similar kind of diversity in terms of the ecology. But in contrast to the ungulates, the carnivores are not nearly as leggy. Um, here are a bunch of guys you see today in Africa. You have the small carnivores, the, the cat and the jackal, the cat and the cat. And you have a bunch of animals who are pursuit predators, like the hyena, the hunting dog, the cheetah. You look at their equivalents in North America. This is a kind of bone crushing dog. This is one sort of extinct family called bear dog. This is actually a running bear. This is a saber toothed cat mimic. They're all much more subtly built. They are not long leggy animals like the, like the carnivores are today in Africa, who do the fast running, or even the wolves in North America. And you might ask the question, well, why has no one noticed this? Why, you know, why does everyone sort of think of these guys as being, that while they portrayed in fossil reconstructions as being wolf-like pack hunters? Part of the reason, I think, is that their heads look very wolf-like, and skulls and teeth are much easier to come by in the fossil record than are limb bones and look much more impressive than limb bones, okay? But people, because they look wolf-like in their heads, people on the skulls, people have often tended to sort of say, well, they must just have been wolf-like. After all, we have wolves today. We must have had wolves back then. I want to show you a picture that is a great illustration from a, a popular book on mammal evolution, how some of these animals have been falsely reconstructed. This is, this is a reconstruction of one of these uh, extinct bear dogs that was around in the Marcine. And as you can see, they've made it look very leggy and have a very hand. Here's the heel. It's great long foot bones. This animal looks a very fast runner. Unfortunately, I point to where it meets, so if you look at, at the skeleton up there and just see where the heel is, can you see where the heel is there? It's got a very short foot. It's got a lot of badger. It's not. A, a, and here they have the skeleton side by side with the construction with, with actually no comment. I find it very strange. This is a great example of how people have tended to portray these beasts as being like modern day fast running carnivores when, when they clearly weren't. In fact, we don't see any animal that would have been a decent pursuit type person until the Pleiades in anywhere in the world. This is an interesting beast. This is a cheetah like hyena that roam not only across Africa, but also uh, across Eurasia and into North America for a short while. That, that, was, that was that pink cross I told you to look for in the picture. But nothing built like this beast with, with long foot bones like this is known anywhere. 
until uh, the Pliocene, until about five million years ago. And remember that herbivores got their long legs some 15 to 20 million years earlier than that. Okay, so if you're looking just at legginess, we can definitely say you don't have leggy carnivores until quite recently in terms of the fossil record. But is legginess the best criterion? After all, there are even some carnivores around today who could fool you as to what, the, as to what they actually did. Here are some examples. Hyenas, we get wasped out slide, oh well. There, there are four kinds of hyenas. There's one guy up in the upper left with the north, it's the aardwolf. It's a termite eating hyena. So that doesn't count. Okay, here we have the spotted hyena that is a pack hunter and a pursuit predator. Here we have the brown hyena and the striped hyena. These guys are not pursuit hunters, they're ambush hunters and they hunt uh, either alone or in pairs. But they're all closely related, and in fact, despite its behavior, the spotted hyena isn't really any more leggy than the other hyenas. So this is an animal that might have fooled us in the fossil record. We might have said, oh, it, it doesn't look leggy enough to be a pursuit predator. And we might have mistaken that for an ambusher. On the other hand, we also have some guys around today who are very leggy, but who are not pursuit predators. This is the main wolf from South America. And it looks like it ought to be a really, really fast runner with those long legs. But this, this animal is absolutely a fox on stilts. It eats, it eats small birds and rodents that live on the pampas grass, and it really has long legs to see over the grass. It's not a fast runner at all. Also, things like the serval cat in Africa. That has very long legs, but again, it's an ambush predator. It's you know, sort of great pounce behavior here. It's an ambush predator on small rodents again, and it really seems to have long paws to stick its paw into the rock crevices and to get things out of there. And so, you, if, any, if any of you, any of you have, had, have cats at home, you know cats will do that with their paws. And this guy has very long legs, apparently for that purpose. It's not a fast runner. So, is there any other way? Is there something else we can do to? Um, look at these animals and to see what other clues we could get about whether or not these fossil animals were fast-running pursuit predators. This is some work I did with my uh, then graduate student, Trisha Wilhelm. And what we did, we did a multivariate analysis of multiple measures of limb proportions. We took a whole bunch of limb measurements that measured not just length of bones, but also robusticity, size of the articular surfaces, a whole bunch of measurements. And what we did was then we, 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 we divided known carnivores, this is, this is looking mainly at larger, larger carnivores, we divided them into three types of behavior based on their observed known behavior. Pursuit predators, things like wolves, oh, this is a raccoon. This picture was, was to remind me to tell you that uh, the majority of carnivores are small generalists that we didn't look at. Okay, so wolves are pursuit of predators. Uh, other, big, other dogs, like the hunting dog, and the jackal, and the doll, and the dingo were in there too. Um, cheetah is a pursuit predator, as is a spotted hyena, which I showed you earlier on. Ambush predators include some dogs, like the maned wolf, and lots of cats, like this is a tiger, here are some lions. A picture I took myself, isn't that great? Um, in, in Africa, in Zambia. Lance being the uh, one odd man out, the ambush predator who hunts in packs. And then we also looked at a, a group of, of generalists, animals who are not specialized predators and who are somewhat what more omnivorous, including things like uh, bears, wolverines, the, the glutton. And also some, uh, also some dogs fall in here. Well, garbage hands, yeah, but the raccoon dog of Southeast Asia is an omnivorous dog, um, more of a generalist. The point being is that our three different groups of animals to look at were not from ones did not represent a single family in each case. They, they crossed taxonomic boundaries, so they weren't looking at, at an effect just due to, uh, to being interrelated. 
So we did this uh, multivariate analysis called discriminant analysis, and I'm not going to go into details. Of what, we are. So what this does, basically, you put all these measurements into the computer, and it sorts them out in multi-dimensional, in multi-dimensional hyperspace. And in discriminant analysis, what we ask it is, if we tell you that there are three groups here based on some criteria, in our case, the criteria of, of, of uh, behavior during predation, then can you cluster them according to these different things we've given you, the, the different bone measurements? And the answer is basically yes. Ignore these things here for the time bit, okay? What it did was, these different uh, colored eggs here, these are circles drawn around the distribution of where modern species fell in this hyperspace. So let's show you, it, it basically sort of takes all these measurements, zumbles them around, and pulls them out as sort of pulling on one major axis or a second major axis. The first major axis here appears to be a speed versus power axis. Animals are pulled pull out here are more likely built with longest legs, and the uh, here are more heavily built with shorter legs. The second axis seems to be a mainly more terrestrial, which is more sort of semi arboreal axis. Up here, animals have longer legs and more powerful high legs. Down here, that shorter legs, more powerful four legs. And what you can see is that the computer did sort out very nicely. It was only on that right here. But it did sort out modern animals. It was a suit group, an animal group, and a generalist group. Then what we did, we fed in data from fossil animals and said, OK, do any of the fossil guys form within the group of pursuit predators? Interestingly enough, no fossil animal clustered with any of the living animals. <laughs> I think what's telling us is that this guy is still out in the limb here, this is a little dog. But mainly, all these fossil species are, if you can believe they acted on here, they're, they're more heavily proportioned and more powerfully built than are the majority of present day carnivores, at least the pursuit or ambush carnivores. Because they fall outside of the boundary of the living animals, you can't really look at that and give any kind of precise prediction of exactly what they did. But what you can say is this is more evidence to say that there were no pursuit predators like modern day pursuit predators back in the Marseille, back you know, 20 to 10 million years ago. Okay, so that's the main information showing that as far as we can tell, there was no correlated evolution between the carnivores and the herbivores. Carnivore, you have no carnivores around that look like modern day pursuit predators until uh, about five million years ago. If that's the case, there has to be some other reason for those herbivores getting longer legs. Because if they were not, if they were not pursuit carnivores around, who were they running from? Okay? So we'll come back to what those other reasons might have been in a second. The second um, thing I was going to tell you about was the results of living animals. What I did, this was some work I did with Ted Garland at uh, the University of Wisconsin in Madison. And we showed that if we take our index of legginess, the the metatarsal hip to femur ratio, if you compared the running specialists against the non-running specialists, yes, there was a significant difference in correlation between speed and running. So we were sort of limited in the, in the number of animals we could use because the number of animals for which there's information on maximum speed isn't that great. But if you look within the group of more specialized animals, carnivores on the one hand, herbivores on the other, there's no simple correlation between the absolute length of the leg and the speed. And I've said we've done all kinds of data manipulation I put that up in case someone starts on me later on. I mean, we did, we, we did all the things we ought to have done to, to make sure there were no biases in the data and, and, and no biases in the method. And we still um, came up with the same answer, that no, if, you, if you're comparing apples and apples rather than or, you know, apples and oranges, compare run, long-leg carnivores or compare long-leg herbivores with each other, there's no one-to-one correspondence between how long legs they are 
and how fast they were. This is looking at species, not individuals, looking at species. So again, there's more evidence to fuel my idea that I'm not so sure that animals get long legs in order to run. I think once they have long legs, they can run fast, but I'm not sure it's why they get them in the first place, as shown here. Here, question, are they about, are they, are they sort of cursorial, these leggy adaptations, are they really about high-speed locomotion? Even if they permit high-speed locomotion, and may be essential for high-speed locomotion, or were they initially evolved in order to increase efficiency at slower speeds. Okay. Why might I think this? Longer legs are going to give you more efficient means of transport from one place to another. For the simple reason, people have looked at animals, how animals move and put oxygen masks on them and everything else. I have already found out that the cost per stride are constant. So it's the number of strides you take that um, determines how expensive it is for you to go a certain distance. So if I were to walk from here to that chair taking 10 short strides, it would cost me twice as much as if I took five long strides in terms of metabolic energy. The little cartoon is been trying to show you the bigger animals have longer strides. Anyway, big animals tend to be more efficient at transport and increasing your leg length is going to give you a longer stride on top of that. And so maybe if you increase the leg length, it's going to uh, increase, to, to make your transport more efficient. Now, people normally think of increasing, uh, being more efficient as applying to fast speed, so the gallop, let's say. Yeah. But actually, it seems that increasing the length of your stride, increasing the length of your leg, is going to contribute equally at, at slower speeds too. I hope we can decode the little graph here. This is showing some data taken from the work of Colin Pennycook at Bristol. And what it's showing, along here we have shoulder height. This huge different point here is a different species of angulate, a different gait. Walk here, trot here, stand up there. Here is the shoulder height, which is an estimate of how long their legs are. And here is the reciprocal of stepping frequency. So up at the top, that's taking a lot of steps, and down here is taking a few steps. What it's showing you is that if you have longer legs, you need to take fewer strides to go, to get in, to go in any given difference. But the slope of the line, the, the amount it makes a difference, if you like, is adjusted and it's exactly the same for those three gates, for the fast hand and the medium trot or the slow walk. Even though the absolute length of stride taken is shorter than the length of the gallop in the counter, um, the amount by which it makes you more efficient is the same. Um, and why, you know, why would walking efficiency be important? Well, you know, if you're an animal who needs to forage a lot and walk around a lot per day, it's been shown that just the daily walking around contributes about 50, is about 15 percent of the total of the total budget of the energy of a sheep doesn't sound very much, but if you look at counts, if you can knock that, a sheep already has quite long legs for its size. Maybe by doing that, it's knocked down that from, from 30%. Who knows? Another way of having longer legs is going to contribute to your efficiency, apart from increasing your stride length, is that with those long legs, you can bunch your muscles up at the top of the leg and run the tendons down to the feet and use those tendons to store elastic energy. This shows how a horse will store energy in its, in its, its long tendons during the gallop and sort of bounce back like a pogo stick. It's always been thought that only happens in fast speeds, but I can give you an example of how it happens in slow speeds even in our cells using our long Achilles tendon at the back of our leg. If you're walking along and you come to think about walking down a corridor and you come to a flight of steps going up, how are you going to walk up that flight of steps? Are you going to put your heel flat on the step or are you going to put your toe on the step? You put your toe on the step and let your leg sort of go down a little bit to give you a bounce up the step. It's actually quite tiring to walk up the steps putting your heel flat on the step. 
So we even use this idea of elastic storage in, in our tendons and our legs, even in our unmodified fleshy legs with, with quite short tendons. So think about how much more energy could be saved in a long leg animal or horse with long tendons, even at slow gait. Okay. So the point is, is that when we look at how this relates to how animals actually behave in the wild, bigger animals have relatively, proportionally larger home ranges than smaller ones do. Big animals don't, don't just range more per day in proportion to their size, they range proportionally more per day. And so they're going to incur larger costs. And of course, when you get your, your, your leggy animals tend to be bigger animals, and maybe they're incurring more costs, maybe having longer legs still helps in this ranging cost. Other thing is to think, what, what was going on back when we see an increase in leg length? I think we saw it in the early Miocene when we have this change in habitat to a more open grassland habitat. Now, that's the point when you get more leggy ungulates. And the traditional explanation has always been, well, of course they need to be, be more leggy then. They're out in the open. They're not in the safety of the forest. They need to have longer legs to run away. But if you already see, there's nothing there for them to run away from. And they're at least going, I'm not running after them. There has to be some other reason. If we look at living animals, ignore the scars for a second, the legs of animals found today in what we would call open habitats, like grasslands, savannas, and prairies, are more leggy with longer foot bones than animals found in the closed habitats or forests and woodland. And again, that's not going to be interpreted as an anti predation uh, device in the open habitat diet. But remember, when we first saw this, there were no pursuit carnivores. If you look at how the home range relates to, so, okay, so open habitat animals have longer legs. What else is true of open habitat animals? They have proportionally bigger home range for their size. This shows you the body mass along here, the dotted line is lumping all ungulates together. Each uh, little uh, symbol here is a bit exclusive. The open symbols show animals who live in the open habitats, the grasslands and prairies. The black symbols show animals live in closed habitats, the uh, forest and woodland. These will now show the difference in the importance in the animals. What you can see is there's actually a, a difference. Any, any, so this is the home, home range size here, the body mass. So, diff, so different uh, relations between the size of the home range and body mass. In the open habitat animals and the closed habitat ones, these, you can even just eyeball it and see most of the open symbols are far from that one. But those two lines are different statistically. Now, it would be nice if I could have told you that I had done some statistics trying to correlate leg length with home range and have found a direct correlation. There's a weak correlation. Part of the problem is home range data are actually quite hard to obtain and they're messy. Animals will have a different home range and different habitats. And I wasn't able to actually squeeze anything decent out of this data, except to show you that this is general correlation that does hold true with my hypothesis. I think the problem was what I used was average home range over the whole species mean. Maybe I should have used maximum home range or minimum home range. I should go back and analyze this data. Anyway, we do have some evidence to corroborate the idea that animals in more open habitats are going to have a bigger home range, they're going to be wandering farther per day, they're going to be walking more per day. They also have longer legs. Are these longer legs about this idea they're going to be, they're going to have um, further to walk per day, they need to have a more efficient way of walking. So I, c I can't get, I can't do better than this in terms of the living animal data, but there is a way that we can test this with the fossil record. We said before, I'll we'll go back a couple here. Okay. It was in the early Marcy, it was about 20 to 25 million years ago in North America, 
that you have the change from more forest to grassland and the ungulates drop along the legs. Did this change in climate as we can, and the kind of environment as determined by the record from fossil plants, did that happen at different times on different continents? And if so, was that then also correlated, correlated with a different timing of getting ungulates who are more leggy? And the answer actually, although this is, this is not, I have not done this in a formalised way, the general answer is yes. If we look at North America, when you first have your predatory grasslands over here in the, in the uh, early Marcine, it's still woodland in Africa and Europe. And these guys are way in advance at this point in the of time in terms of being ready compared to these guys. In contrast, South America seems to get its open grasslands earlier, a few million earlier than North America, and again, its ungulates sort of go leggy earlier. So again, this is corrective evidence. None of this stuff provides you with firm truth, but it is support for the hypothesis. So anyway, to sum up, whatever's really going on with this kind of stuff, we can certainly say we have definite evidence to show that there is not coordinated co-evolution co between carnivores and ungulates. This didn't happen. These guys got leggy by themselves. 15 to 20 million years before, carnivores got leggy. If they could not have been doing it to escape the carnivores. Why were they doing it? We have some good circumstantial corroborative evidence to suggest at least it could have been to do with ranging costs in a different kind of environment needing to walk more per day, these longer legs were initially about needing to walk more, which incidentally made them faster runners. That isn't why they did that initially. Why do carnivores get longer legs? Well, carnivores catch up in the plight of Pleistocene. That's where you have even the climate changing even more extreme. So when you first see animals who we know today are migratory, maybe the carnivores were just trying to keep pace with the ungulates, following them around. And they too got longer legs in association with following the migratory herds, which then gave them, at that point, the capacity to run faster. But a lot of that is speculation. We are not really quite sure why things get long legs. But one thing I can definitely tell you is there was no co-evolution of this trait between carnivores and herbivores. Thank you. Subspecies. Those subspecies that are migratory have somewhat longer length than those who aren't. But um, across, you know, are, are the migratory zebra more, have long, do they have longer lengths than non migratory zebra? No. But I mean, so across species as a whole, no. I think basically what's happened is these guys are already adapted to be efficient transport machines. And the ones that become migratory maybe have some change in terms of, of their physiology at this point rather than their anatomy. You don't see any difference in anatomy across the board. You can't separate out migratory from non-migratory species just by their anatomy. Bill. Yeah, it seems possible that even though there, there's no obvious correlated evolution, and you, you haven't seen this mm -hmm. kind of like that change you know, in, the, in the ratios that predation and uh, predation avoidance could have, have driven the changes that you did see. Suppose uh, when the, the ungulates moved out of the forest, uh, they were able to uh, 
utilize higher speeds because mm -hmm. they didn't have to worry about running into trees and were able to get away from whatever predators were there. Uh, it may be that because there weren't these coursing predators, in, in long distance pursuit predators until fairly recently, um, there wasn't the advantage for the predators to, you know, to develop those long ratio, you know, the, the longer limbs. Um, I think the question I'm really asking of was it co-evolutionary? And, I mean, were there more legular ungulates in the open habitat? Was that legginess still related to being around the ambush predators? I mean, uh, that's the question I think it's... It, you're never going to be able to say, no, it wasn't. Um, but one thing you can say, well, there weren't things like wolves back then. We've, we've, we've interpreted these guys as being... We've, we've sort of forced these extinct carnivores into the roles of being wolf-like pack hunters, but it doesn't look like they, like, like, like they say really were. They don't fit the morphology. Um, is there any other reason why you might want long legs in open habitat apart from fast running? And that's what I've been trying to get at as well. I mean, right. could there be another explanation? In fact, there's some work being done by uh, John Bertram at uh, Cornell University, the vet school there. He was sort of intrigued by this idea, and he's doing a lot of work now on horse limbs, and is trying to show that a number of the, the specific features of living horses actually do seem to be specifically for stamina at slow gates and not for speed at high gates. And uh, I'm just trying to, you know, it's just, I don't know, I guess I, guess I have this bit of a, of, of a devil in me. If I see a traditional idea that everyone's believed for a long while, I want to say, well, is that really true? How can I try and dismantle it? And, my, and it's like, even if it proves in the end I'm wrong, what I'm, trying to, what I'm, more, what I'm more concerned with is getting people, people to think about it and just say, OK, is this, a, this is a popular story. Is there really a basis for it? And even if we end up coming back to, to, to the old view, will we have learned something on the way? I mean, a great example of this kind of stuff is the stuff that Jim would tell you about, about our dinosaurs endothermic. I think even if we ended up coming back to the idea that dinosaurs are not endothermic, we will sort of learn an awful lot about dinosaur biology in the course of doing it, rather than just the traditional idea that they're, they're reptiles, so they have to be cold-blooded, you know? So, but I do think there's more going on than just a simple... And I, I, I also do think that... I think we're very biased by the idea of seeing predators as being the sort of kings of the jungle, rulers of evolution. You know, whenever you turn a TV program on and you see lions chasing zebras, you know, for half an hour in a, a Nova program, how many millions of feet of, of, on the cutting room floor of lions go, oh, <laughs> you know what I mean? They're not doing that all the time. How much of an impact is it actually having on the animals in general, you know? Hi. I find it kind of interesting question in terms of pursuit hunters in terms of high speed. It seems to me the point of pursuit hunters is that they don't go at high speed. They go at a long, efficient well, one. And it's the sprinters who go at fast speed, and those are, of course, people or animals or people even in track and field. You can see the same thing. Right. Short limbs okay. for fast speed. Yeah, I think your point. I think the point being is it's always been assumed that long legs are about sustained running or fast speed locomotion. I guess my feeling is that you know, if you're going to do a quick burst of speed, you don't have to be as adaptive, certainly not, not as long-legged. And it seems to me that if you're having somebody jump out of you from behind a bush, um, it's not going to make a lot of difference whether you can run for a long distance or not. You're either going to get away or, or you aren't. No, I, I take your point. If an ambush predator can produce bursts of speed. I guess I pursue predators. I'm meaning not just fast speed, but sustained fast speed, like we think of it in a racehorse or a greyhound, we think of today as being a fast runner. Right. Okay,